So to transition from the bit where I've attacked his integrity to the bit where we start to deal with the Bible, this would be a good starting passage, Hebrews 10. Now, on his video, Bad News for Osas, he's only put verses 30 to 31 on the screen, but he does verbally quote verse 26. Now, verse 26 is right up there with James 2 as one of the most used, well, misused and abused passages in the Bible that conditional security advocates love to point to. They think that's like a case closed there. So have a look at what he says about what he thinks that means, particularly where it says there remains no more sacrifice for sins. And then we're going to go through Hebrews 10 in context and see what that verse actually says. And when you realise, when you read it to its logical conclusion, it more or less says the exact opposite, actually, of what he interprets it. And I think if you can grasp what Hebrews 10 is saying, I think a lot more other stuff in the Bible will probably start to make more sense as well, particularly in the way that sacrifices work um, in the Old Testament and how they work in the New Testament. So we'll just have a look what he has to say about this first. So there you have it, folks. Um, he emphasised the point about the Lord judging his people, because I guess some people that he's confronted have tried to make it out as if it's people that aren't his people. They just mix with good, uh, God's people. Well, no, as he said, the Lord will judge his people. That's the uh, context there. Uh, but he mentioned verse 26. And if you notice the way that he interpreted that verse he interprets that if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth there remains no more sacrifice for sins and what what he's essentially saying is that your sin is not covered by a sacrifice there is no available sacrifice for it so another way of phrasing this would be Jesus' sacrifice is no longer effective for you so ergo you lose your salvation. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at Hebrews 10 in its context, and we'll we'll briefly talk about the uh, Old Testament sacrifices as well, and, and that will help give us the context as to what the writer of Hebrews really means when he says there remains no more sacrifice. And if you follow it to its logical conclusion, it will actually say the exact opposite of what this guy says. So actually, I'm going to go back to Hebrews 9, actually, just back up just a little bit before 10 for some full context. So when you're reading uh, chapter 9, he's talking about the differences in the testaments and the need for uh, blood to be shed. So uh, you can see there, moreover, he in verse 21, that's Moses. And it explains that in verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no uh, remission, or you might say uh, forgiveness of sin. So that there needs to be the shedding of blood there, as we can see. Now in verse 23, uh, you'll see then that it says the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified. And so what we can take to mean from this is that everything, the kind of things that Moses would have done carnally in the tabernacle, Jesus would have done in, in heavenly places. Okay. And this is explained in verse 24. It says, for Christ is not entered into the holy places that are, and here's the key bit, made with hands. So, uh, but the, the Old Testament things are figures, as it goes on to say, but the, these things are in heaven itself. So basically what Christ is doing, Christ isn't just doing things on the earth. He's doing things in, in heavenly places. So it's everything that Moses did is just a carnal, physical illustration of what's going on in heavenly places. All right. Further down, then you go to verse 25. And it's explained that nor yet should he offer himself often. So Christ doesn't have to keep doing what he did over and over and over at the cross. Whereas the high priest entered into the holy place every year, as we can see there, Christ didn't need to do that. He only have to offer himself once because he's doing it in heaven. And then verse 26 explains that uh, if if he had to keep doing it over and over again, like the high priest would have had to keep doing it over and over again, then he he would have had to often suffer since the foundation of the world. OK, but it explains that now once in the end of the world, he has appeared to be put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. 
And uh, as it explains, it is appointed once uh, men want to die, but after this, the the judgment. So in in essence, Christ only has to die once. He doesn't have to keep dying and dying over again. That's something that the Catholics believe that he's some kind of perpetual offering or something like that. But no, it, it's a once and for all offering. And it's interesting, although this passage doesn't particularly mention it, it, it does allude to this foundation of the world issue. And there are other passages in the Bible that explain actually Christ died uh, before the foundation of the world, but I'm not going to get too much into that now. So this is what it's leading up to, that uh, we have the Old Testament sacrifices, but these are all a physical shadow of what's going on in heavenly places, okay? And Christ only needs to be offered once. He doesn't need continually offering, which he's going to further explain in Hebrews chapter 10. And so Hebrews 9 ends with verse 28, where it flat out says, Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear a second time. We obviously expect Christ's second coming, but this will be without sin unto salvation. He's not going to go through the cross all over again when he comes back next time. And then uh, bearing in mind that the chapter numbers didn't exist when the writer of Hebrews wrote this letter. So Hebrews 10 carries on the exact same thought that he was just mentioning in Hebrews 9. So he goes on to explain that the law was only a shadow of good things to come, not the very image of those things itself. So these sacrifices, can uh, they're, they're offered year by year continually because they cannot make the comers thereunto perfect. Continual offering, okay? And then he goes on to ask a hypothetical question in verse 2, because if those sacrifices could purge our sins, then would would they have not ceased to be offered? So would they have not stopped offering them continually? But they did keep offering them continually. It couldn't purge all of their sins, because if it had, then the worshippers should have no more conscience of sin. But again, these sacrifices, there is a remembrance, and that's made... Uh, every, every year of sins. So that, again, is just carrying on the same thought that it's already been saying. And the reason is is that it's just simply not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. They're only a carnal example of New Testament things or what Christ is doing in heavenly places. But there's that continual year on year on reminder that we don't have in the New Testament. So we no longer have that same conscience of sins. And then because the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sins, that's why it then goes on to to explain verses 5 to 7 that a body of Christ has been prepared. Okay, so this is going to be a perfect sacrifice because God has had no pleasure in the burnt offerings and the Old Testament sacrifices for sin. And then in verse 8 and 9, he essentially uh, repeats what he's already said so he just sort of rephrases it a little bit for emphasis and then notice this important bit in verse 10 this is important so by the which we uh, will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of jesus christ and watch this it ends saying once and for all this is super important because this is setting everything for what hebrews 10 is trying to explain when it will get to verse 26 okay it's once and for all. Jesus has done this once and for all. And then just in case you missed it from the verses that we've already read, he then goes on to explain the exact same point in verse 11 and 12, that the priests are daily ministering, doing oftentimes the same sacrifices and they can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus Christ, in verse 12, offered one sacrifice for sins forever sat down at the right of uh, right hand of god so this is important folks it's forever okay everything that jesus did replacing the old testament sacrifices it's done forever you see he keeps repeating it he keeps saying it in different ways and yet people still want to quote verse 26 completely out of context and then 13 to 16 are just going to requalify this and again if you've not read it properly in the verses that we've just been reading once again in verse 14 for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified again this is the the context that the conditional security folk don't want to read to you okay they don't make a big deal out of this 
because it's too convenient for them to just quote verse 26 on its own. And then using the Holy Ghost as the uh, witness to us, it's then quoting Old Testament passages to justify this point, that this is the covenant I will make with them, the new covenant. After those days, I will put my laws into their hearts and in, in their minds will I write them. Now, there is something important here in verse 16 that we do need to address because otherwise conditional security folk like a PUC or an apologetics will try and use this verse against you. They'll say, well, see, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. Well, yes, there is a mention of the law there and it being written in your heart. But it's already explained elsewhere in, in the Bible that in regards to your righteousness and in regards to salvation, it cannot be attained by the works of the law. OK, so for salvation, it's without law. However, having said that, because God has written the laws in our hearts, it's still his will that we obey them. And Jesus re-emphasized some of the uh, Old Testament commandments like, you know, you shall not steal, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not commit murder and so on and so on and so on. So it's still right that we do those things. But salvation is apart from those things. And so concluding the issue of law, then, well, yes, follow the laws in in terms of turning from your sins etc but that's not going to help your salvation okay because everything that this chapter is pointing to is that christ is the offering the sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins you don't turn from your own sins to get forgiveness for those sins that's christ's job and then once you've believed on him he will write the law on your heart and then from there as a believer you you follow the law but not to be saved though it's very important that we make that distinction and remember that when we um, looked at discrediting his integrity, he would sometimes use one argument and then use a counter argument that cancels out his other argument when it suits him to do so. So people like that will use a verse like this to explain about the law written on your hearts and they'll argue that, see, you need to follow the laws. But we already know that we're not justified by the law. OK, so this is where we separate our works from our salvation. Yes, it's right to do works, but no, not for salvation. OK. And so then in verse 17, the writer of Hebrews will quote the Old Testament when it was prophesied their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So this is completely counter to conditional security because it would rely on God remembering your sins. But here it's saying I will remember them no more. Now, why is that? Well, he says, well, where there is forgiveness of these, there is no more offering for sin. So again, Jesus is the final offering for sin. OK, and that's why God will remember no more because of the fact that Jesus Christ is the once and final sacrifice. OK. And so then, verse 19 onwards, we'll start to explain the new life of people whose sins are covered with Jesus' offering. So, therefore, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And we have a new and living way, and he has consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. And uh, he's also explained this as well uh, in Hebrews, that Jesus Christ is the final high priest that cannot be touched by our infirmities. And so then we can uh, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with water. So you see how his sprinkling, his blood offering, deals with the issue of conscience for sin it deals with the issue of remembrance for sin it washes us okay it takes away that conscience of sin and so that now that jesus's offering has covered us it's washed us it's taken away the remembrance of our sins well as per verse 22 now we can draw near with that full assurance of faith so because we have that full assurance of faith then that takes us on to verse 23 let's hold fast the profession of our faith. Let's not waver in that faith. Let's have full confidence in what Christ has accomplished. And then in verse 24, and again, this is going to be a verse that Epiusion and people like that would love to point to because it again alludes to our works and he thinks that we need works of faith 
to be saved. But all the salvation is all dealt with Jesus' offering. Jesus' offering is to deal with your sin. But now that we can have that full assurance, and now that we can hold fast our profession of faith, well, now that we've got that sorted, then let's consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. And you see, the mistake that these conditional security folk and these work salvation folk make is that they take something that comes after faith, something that's for saved people, and they make that part of the condition to be saved. And I'll get back into that in a moment, but let's just go all the way up to 26 and then we can re-examine uh, some of the stuff about sacrifices. I'll, I'll try and simplify it for anybody that I may have lost at this point and we'll explain what's wrong with uh, mixing works and, and faith together for salvation. So in verse 25, it gives us a good example of provoking each other to good work. So that's why we assemble together. We, you know, we gather together. Places like church, that's to provoke one another to good works, okay? You're not going to get that provoking if you're a Christian in isolation that never assembles with anybody for being provoked into doing good works. And so now that we've read this passage in its full context, we now know what verse 26 means. So if we sin willfully, there remains no more sacrifice for sins because Jesus is the final sacrifice once and for all. If you sin again, he does not need to die all over again. He does not need to go to the cross all over again. He is the once and for all sacrifice for the remission of our sins and our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with water. So this is just a, a visual illustration for those of you that perhaps don't know very much about this. Um, if you look at the book of Leviticus, you get a lot of details about the Old Testament sacrifices where every time somebody sins, there's a certain offering that he has to bring. And there may be an offering for the ordinary man and an offering for the ruler um, and so on. And there was also offerings that the high priest had to do every year for the for the people. So essentially, uh, here's the pattern that would happen. So you see that God's own people sinned. This is not uh, a law that applied to the Philistines or the Amalekites or whoever. The, they didn't have a Levitical priest. Or this is specifically the nation of Israel. Well, guess what? God's own people sinned. It happened. So then because God's own people sinned, and you can take this to be either an individual or the, the group collectively, we then see that a sacrifice was then remaining. So they would have to go to the temple and they would have to bring their sacrifice and they would have to do the sacrifice and sprinkle the blood and so on and so forth. Problem is with that, as soon as they, you know, shortly after they've done that sacrifice, it wouldn't take very long again before then God's own people sinned again. That That's just what would happen. So again, there would be another sacrifice remaining for sins. So they would have to go to the altar, sprinkle the blood, do the burnt offering and all the other offerings that they had to do and so on and so forth. Once they've done that sacrifice, well, again, what would happen? God's own people would sin again. And so what happens then? Well, once again, they need to bring the sacrifices to the altar and on and on and on it goes. And so you can see how this is a continual offering throughout the Old Testament. So it's very easy to understand when, when you see it illustrated like this. So then what's changed in the New Testament? Well, it's very easy to see what changed in the New Testament because Hebrews has just been explaining it to us in the verses we looked at. So we see that God's own people sin. It, it happens. But there now remains no more sacrifice for sin. Jesus doesn't have to go through all of the cross again. And there's nothing in this passage to indicate that somebody has to repent and get saved all over again either. That's just not indicated in this passage at all. At least when I say repented, I mean for salvation is what I mean. And then what happens is, well, God's people sin again. Unfortunately, it does happen. But nevertheless, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. And then God's people sin again, but once again, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Now, why does there remain no more sacrifice for sins? Well, it's been clearly explained that Jesus is the once and for all sacrifice. So that's what verse 26 means. It does not mean that Jesus' sacrifice stops being effective. That's the very opposite of what it means. And people who think that that's what it means, well, you go and offer a bull or a ram at the temple then, if, if you think that that's what that actually means.
And so why this passage helps is that it helps you to understand the difference between the forgiveness of sins or the, the remission of sins, plural or collectively, versus the difference between God's ongoing forgiveness of sins or, or the need to be forgiven on an ongoing basis. Okay. And so backing up in uh, chapter 9, verse 22, it said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So by Christ shedding his blood, there, that's where the remission was. Okay. So uh, when, when the King James Bible uses the word remission, uh, as far as I understand it, it comes from the same root word as forgiveness that it's translated from. So modern Bibles will just say forgiveness, whereas what the King James does is it sometimes uses the word forgiveness when something's kind of on an ongoing basis, like in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us, Lord, our sins. But then it often uses the word remission collectively when it's like the remission of sins as opposed to the forgiveness of sins. So uh, you can argue about whether that's right to do that or not, but it, it just helps explain um, the difference. So Moving back up then to uh, chapter 10, verse 26, we can see if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of truth, well, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Jesus doesn't have to die all over again. There's not even an indication that you have to believe and get baptized and go through all of that again to get your salvation back or anything like that. The blood has already been shed. The sacrifice has already been offered. It's the final sacrifice. So the remission of sins, the collective, plural, overall forgiveness of sins, is already dealt with. There's already been bloodshed. Jesus' sacrifice has already covered it. There's no more conscience of that sin. So then what's going? What's God going to do to you then if you carry on sinning? If he says, I'm going to remember your sin no more, Matt, the blood of Jesus is going to cover your sin, what is God going to do? Because he's not just going to sit back and allow you to sin, right? Well, that's going to be explained after verse 26. So then, if we sin willfully, Jesus doesn't have to die again. There's not even any indication that you need to get resaved all over again. But this is what you can expect in verse 27. It says, a fear, certain fearful looking for judgment. Okay, we can expect that. And fiery indignation, which shall devour the, the adversaries. So the adversaries, the ones who are, uh, continue to, to keep sinning. Okay, and it does explain that the Lord shall judge his people. So I, I definitely think this is referring to saved people. It's not referring to those outside. Now, the problem with EPUC on apologetics and people like him is that they read the fiery indignation and they automatically assume it means hell. But the thing is, a lot of the passages that he picks out about how you can lose salvation or how God's going to judge you in hell, it, it's funny how he uses verses that don't use these words. Verses that don't mention eternal life, verses that don't mention salvation, verses that don't even mention the word hell. If if the writer of Hebrews meant hell by that, he could have just said hell. Okay, now if, if the people today who, uh, various false prophets today, one of the accusations that people like me and also people like Epiusion would throw against them is that they don't talk about these subjects. They don't want to talk about hell. They don't want to address the hard stuff in the Bible. They always use fancy language to dance around it. And yet Epiusion indirectly accuses the apostles of doing the same thing because he keeps reading the word hell when they never use the word hell. So unless you think they're using fluffy language to not mention the H word, why wouldn't he just say hell if that's what he really meant? Like, what? let's cut the fluffy language that, that's ambiguous. Let's just get straight to the point, okay? But this is how they accuse the apostles of talking. They accuse them of fluffy language indirectly. And he's going to do it elsewhere when we look at some of his other stuff. Like, I think he does it to Galatians as well, which, again, it's funny because Paul, I, I don't even think the word hell even appears in any of Paul's letters in the concordance. But there you go. We'll, we'll deal with that as we get to it. But he gives us an example of the fiery indignation. Okay, so what is the fiery indignation that we can expect? Well, he does explain that he who died without mercy, uh, sorry, he who despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So there's an example of the kind of uh, things we can expect, the, the indignation if we sin willfully. All right, so this is, there's only an indication that this is a physical death because what would happen at certain laws in the Old Testament, if you violated those laws, 
there were certain laws where you could be put to death. Okay. So that's, that's the context. That's what he's giving us to go on to understand what he means by fiery indignation. He doesn't explain anything that has anything to do with hell or anything like that. And then he goes on to say, how much sore a punishment suppose you shall he be thought worthy? So the one who was trampled under the foot, foot, the son of God by doing this, this willful sin and has counted the blood of the covenant an unholy thing. And notice it says he was sanctified past tense. There is nothing in this passage that says he suddenly becomes unsanctified, but he is counting the blood an unholy thing and has done despite unto the spirit of grace. So it doesn't say he's fallen from grace. It doesn't say grace no longer applies to this person, but he has done this in spite of grace. And then it, you know, it goes on to say vengeance belongs to me and I will recompense. And it is a fearful thing to fall into the uh, hands of the living God. So people like Epiusi and Apologetics, they'll point to people in the Bible and they'll say this person lost his salvation and that person lost his salvation. But when you go to the Bible, their salvation and their eternal life isn't mentioned. So what we're going to do is to help expand on what we've learned here. Okay, we're going to look at other examples in the Old Testament of people who despised Moses' law or did some great willful sin. And then we're going to look at the way God dealt with them. Because what does he mean here by sore a punishment? And believe it or not, God can punish you in wor worse ways than just dying, even if you're not going to hell, right? Believe it or not. So we're going to look at examples, but there's one key point that I want to get across to you here. So then, if God's people sin willfully, well, the blood offering was already made, Earlier in the chapter, it already explained it has perfected forever them that are sanctified. And here, when it refers to the adversaries, it says he was sanctified. And this is what we can call the remission or the forgiveness of sins. However, as the chapter then later explains, one can expect fire indignation that may punish us sorely. And so we see why God says that, like Jesus told his disciples, when you pray, say, give us, Lord, our daily bread and forgive us our sins because this is what you need to be watching out for so this is what you need to be asking forgiveness for not not salvation related so as i mentioned we're going to look at other examples of people in the bible who despised moses law and how they were punished sorely for that so i thought a good place to start would be uh, the example of david david is obviously a very well-known bible character uh, he was a man after God's own heart. There were many things that David did right. We get a lot of our Psalms from David, but we also know of the uh, rather famous story where he uh, killed Uriah to commit adultery with his wife. Now, if you've seen my uh, video on the Gospel of John chapter 7 for biblical salvation settled once and for all, towards the end of the video, I actually addressed this issue of conditional security, including Epiusion, actually, where they base what they believe on things that the Bible doesn't explicitly say. And one of the things that I brought out was uh, some guy makes this comment that Baptists tell you in this OSAS. I give him a reply and say, well, here's the reason why they believe it. And then he replies, well, you didn't pay much attention to the story of what happened to David after uh, the whole Bathsheba incident. So, well, we're going to pay attention to what happens in that story. And you're never going to believe this, but his salvation is not mentioned. Spoiler alert. So um, 2 Samuel chapter 12 is where uh, it documents that uh, David had committed adultery, and that was in the previous chapter. And then the Lord was obviously angry at David. And so the Lord sent Nathan onto David. So the first part of this chapter deals with uh, Nathan coming onto David. Uh, he then gives the, the uh, a parable towards David. And then he explains in uh, verse 7 that, that David is the person being described in the parable. David was obviously uh, very angry at this story, as in verse 5, not realising that, that it was actually about him. Okay, so there's nothing that we need to uh, cover here for what we're talking about in this video. So then once we uh, go through verses 8 and 9, that's where Nathan finishes off talking about the things that David did. And then once we get on to verse 10, that's where we start to see the punishments that God has put on David. So let, let's have a look at how God punished David 
for doing this sin, okay? And it's very important because if you can grasp what's happening here, what we've just explained in Hebrews 10 will make more sense, and what's coming up in this uh, discussion about OSAS and everything else that EPUC owned completely misses will start to make more sense, all right? So let, let's have a look down here. So we start to see in verse 10, Therefore the sword shall never depart from your house. Okay, so there, there's the first punishment there. So we see throughout David's life, his kingdom was subject to war. Uh, it wouldn't really come to peace until uh, Solomon's time uh, after David. Okay, so there, there's the first punishment. And he, go, he goes on to emphasize this. I will raise up evil against you out of your own house in verse 11. So uh, that can be a reference to uh, the infighting that was going on in David's family, his own son's trying to kill each other, trying to kill him, etc., etc. And I will take uh, your wives before your eyes. So another thing, uh, another punishment that was given to David, shall give them unto your neighbour, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun, and so on. So you, you've got that there in verse 11. And so here's here's a crucial point in verse 12. Now this is the most embarrassing thing for, for David here, is that he did these things secretly, but this is going to be done, these punishments will be done before Israel, all Israel and before the sun. So uh, as if it's not already going to be hard enough on David that he's going to receive these punishments, his sin is going to be exposed publicly. Everyone's going to know about this. Everyone's going to know about um, the, these punishments and things. Uh, David then acknowledges uh, that he has sinned against the Lord. So he, do, he does acknowledge it. Now, do pay close attention to... Uh, how David replies here. Notice that he, he, strictly speaking, he does not actually say sorry from what we can see. Um, he does not seem to ask for forgiveness, but he does acknowledge that he sinned. So there you go. So that, that's how you can see how uh, David replied there. Okay, we, he acknowledges his sin. He doesn't ask for forgiveness, strictly speaking, here, or even say that he's sorry, strictly speaking. So it's important not to embellish this, because what, what people like Epiusion Apologetics do, I think his name's Adam, it's probably easier than saying the full channel name, but, but what he does is he embellishes people's repentance in the Bible, or... Uh, he embellishes what actually happened. So even though there's no evidence that somebody repented in sackcloth and ashes, he so, he makes it out as if that probably happened when it's not evident. We'll look up we'll look at other examples of that in a bit. So that's how David responded. Now I'm just zooming in here on thirteen to fourteen because we just need to pay extra close attention to this. So David acknowledged that he sinned against the Lord. We can see that underlined in red there. And then so Nathan says unto David, in response to his acknowledgement, that the Lord has also put away your sin. Okay, and so because the Lord has put away your sin, notice it says, you shall not die, right? Okay, so th this is crucial, and we'll, we'll come back to that in a second, but let, let's just carry on for a minute. So, how be it, because this deed you have given, so despite the fact that God has put away your sin, and you shall not die, how be it, because you have given the enemy's great occasion to blaspheme the Lord, the child that is also born unto you shall surely die okay now this is uh very important so let's get an overall flavor of what's going on here so first it does say that the lord has put away david's sin we've also seen very clearly david shall not die however despite the fact that god has put away david's sin despite the fact that david shall not die despite the fact that david's already been punished by having uh, war and, and the sword being brought and uh, evil against his household nevertheless his child will also his child will die that that is another punishment he's going to receive despite his sin being put away so this is everything that's been pronounced to david now after verse 14 in verse 15, it will then go on to explain how David's child was stricken with sickness. So that's the the last punishment in the list, but being the first to actually be fulfilled. Now, this is very important here, particularly the bit where it says that uh, thou shall not die. 
Now, one thing that I've noticed about uh, Adam Epiusion is that sometimes to justify his conditional security, he'll take verses that re refer to dying and he makes them about eternal life. So a verse says, you shall die, or the man that does this thing shall die by them, or whatever it might be. And he'll make it a salvation verse. He'll make it about eternal salvation. When it's not necessarily clear from the context that salvation is even being discussed. Now, you see, I could just pluck verse 13 here completely out of context and say, well, see, David sinned against the Lord, but God put it away and he shall not die. He didn't lose his salvation. But if you actually read it in context, it's clear that from verse 14 that this is not an eternal damnation sort of a death that David's avoiding here. I mean, I don't think anybody would argue that the child is going to be eternally damned because of what David did. So we do see here that thou shalt not die is a physical kind of a death. And so it's going to be very uh, important to understand this when we deal with a lot of the other verses that he likes to take out of context, that he makes them about death eternally when that's not necessarily the case. Okay, now if we examine what we've seen in this passage, we've seen that David's eternal life is never mentioned. Now, obviously I'm using kind of a logical argument here, uh, but if if losing your salvation is something that can really happen and it's a serious business and there's all these warnings across the Bible that tell us we can lose our salvation, according to Adam, well, would it not then be one of the first things to mention to David? Because wouldn't you think that that's the most important thing? Before you comment on any earthly punishment, surely the worst thing is, hey, David, you have lost your salvation. Nathan never mentions it. It's never mentioned. But then we've seen fools like this guy that once commented, like, you didn't pay any attention to what happened to David. Well, we're looking at what happened to David. His eternal life is not mentioned. And the closest thing that we have is his physical life, because obviously these things are sometimes a, a representation of eternal life, sure. But the closest thing that we have, his physical death, which you could say is a picture of eternal life, if you like, well, he shall not die, and God has put away his sin. And notice that, we, as we just looked at, David hasn't apologised, he hasn't even asked for forgiveness here, but the Lord has already put away his sin. Nevertheless, despite God putting away his sin, he's still going to receive all of these punishments. And so this all ties in with what's referred to as the chastisement of believers. And it's how God deals with the sins of his own people. Now, again, if, if his own people can lose their salvation, that should be the first thing to mention here, because it's the most important thing that's happened to David. It's just simply not mentioned. And so we can start to see how conditional security can't, starts to crumble because they cannot grasp this if their life depended on it. Well, actually, their eternal life does depend on it and they can't grasp it. They just cannot understand this at all. And to be honest, I think with Epiusion, I think it's willing ignorance. I think he just chooses not to understand it because it, it would crumble his doctrine. But we'll, we'll, again, all to come, still more to deal with later. But the chastisement of believers is something that's very well documented in the Bible. Now, typically when we go to our verses about salvation, about how it's by faith and this, that and the other, we go to the New Testament. It's a lot easier to preach the gospel from the New Testament. But when it comes to dealing with how God deals with the sins of his own people, the Old Testament is, is far more abundant than the New Testament because most of the Bible is written about and to God's people. Uh, that's what it deals with a lot. It deals with God's people more than it deals with the heathen by um, a long shot. And so we've obviously got the story from the history, but, but because we're obviously dealing with salvation issues, let's bring this into salvation by looking at some parallel passages in the Old Testament. So Psalm 89 is a really good one to start with. Uh, it's a very long psalm, so I'm not I'm not going to quote the entire psalm. But uh, we see, starting from verse 20, that it starts to talk about David, uh, my servant, and how uh, I anointed him. Okay, so then it goes on to read some stuff about David and uh, his uh, enemies and so on and so forth. We see a reference to... Uh, God's faithness, uh, sorry, faithfulness and mercy being with David there in verse 24. 
And then uh, further down in verse 28, my mercy will I keep for him for evermore. So that's a very important word there. And my covenant shall stand fast with him. And remember, this is, remember that God has foreknowledge. So God already knows the sins that David was going to commit in Second Samuel. Remember, this is all, you know, God has all that foreknowledge, which is another thing where conditional security is going to fall apart. But uh, look in verse 29, his seed also will I make to endure forever. Now, uh, obviously we know that in terms of his physical seed, his physical seed didn't retain the throne and so on, but we know that it was fulfilled in Jesus because we have a lot in the New Testament that talks about how we are the children of like Abraham and people like that through faith, not not by um, ancestry. Okay. Now look at this crucial bit. This is where we get to the very crucial matter. Verse number 30. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, ooh, they lose their salvation. Well, let's let's keep reading and see what happens. Verse 31. If, so there's the important if, they break my statutes and keep not my commandments. Well, what will you do with them, Lord? Will you take away their salvation? Will you blot their name out of the book of life or something? Well, look what God says he's going to do. I will visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Okay, but watch this. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever. Okay, so this is very important what we're seeing here, folks. Okay, what actually happens to the children of David, and we assume that that also means any believer, that this is all the stuff that's going to happen to them. So let, let's recap. So God will visit their in transgressions, their sins, their iniquity with rod, with, with stripes, but he will not take away his loving kindness. His faithfulness will not fail. Yet he will fulfill to David what he agreed he would do. So then let's apply that to us as God's children in the New Testament. So then, I will visit their transgression with the rod. Well, Hebrews 10 has already explained this. If we sin willfully, we ought to be looking for judgment and fiery indignation. This was already explained in Hebrews 10. So then the next bit, nevertheless, my utter loving kindness will I not utterly take from him. Well, it goes without saying that salvation is a part of God's loving kindness, but hold on to that thought because we'll look at some important passages in a moment. And then last bit, I will not break my covenant nor alter what has gone out of my lips. Well, what came out of Jesus' lips? What covenant or agreement did Jesus make with us? Well, he said, all that come to me, I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. I should lose nothing. I will in no wise cast them out. No man shall ever pluck them out of my hand. That's what's come out of his lips. He cannot go against what he said. He will not suffer his faithfulness to fail. He will not break his covenant. So let's pick up on this uh, theme of God's loving kindness that he said he will not utterly take from David's children if they sin against him. And a good psalm to look at would be Psalm 51. Now, uh, some Bibles will say that it's directed to the chief musician. It's a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So it's very uh, specific and relevant to what we've just been looking at in, in the book of Samuel. So uh, notice how he introduces his psalm here. So he says, have mercy upon me, O God. And what what is that based on? What's it according to? Well, it's according to God's loving kindness that we see there. Remember, God said, uh, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him. Well, his loving kindness involves mercy. That's what David's praying for here. Um, and then he goes on to say, according to your the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. So notice the uh, theme which David is appealing to here for his transgressions to be blotted out. It's not because, well, look at me, God, I've turned from all of my sins, so please uh, have mercy upon me. No, it's, it's according entirely to God's loving kindness and according to his mercy. 
And as we carry on working our way through this psalm, look at David's appeal to God. He asks for God to wash him thoroughly and uh, cleanse him from his sin. That's there in verse 2. Uh, he acknowledges his transgression. So uh, notice that he doesn't specifically apologise. He doesn't even commit that he's going to turn from it all and never do it again. But but he does acknowledge it, though. He acknowledges that he's transgressed. And uh, you can see his frustration with his sin here, that he says his sin is uh, ever before him. So, uh, you know, this this seems to be his sin before him, something that he dealt with perhaps on a continual basis. Not necessarily this sp sin specifically, but obviously uh, sin it was an ongoing struggle for David at multiple uh, times during his life, as we know from other stories in the Bible as well. And he goes on further to acknowledge the sin that he's done against God. So, against you, Lord, uh, have I sinned only? So, David... Uh, even though we could argue David sinned against Uriah and sinned against Bethsheba, it was specifically God that he sinned against in the context of this psalm. And interestingly, in verse 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Um, on my channel, I did a video on John chapter 9 for uh, biblical salvation, and we saw from uh, verse 34 that the Pharisees were saying to the man that was uh, healed from his blindness, You were born in sin, and yet you who are you to teach us, essentially? And, and they threw him out. Uh, well, according to David, we're all born in sin, and so it just showed the self-righteousness of the Pharisees there that, that they thought, you know, they didn't need to hear it. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you shall make, make me to know wisdom. And he goes on to ask again for this cleanliness, purge me with the hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. So that there's uh, a good interesting thing there in verse 8. If you want a reason for why David is praying for this, he wants his joy back. He wants his gladness back. And then hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Well, we can see in a way that actually Nathan did say uh, to David that the Lord has put away your sin and yet still we see David here uh, praying for God nevertheless to blot out all of his iniquities when it was already pronounced that, that God has. And then moving further into this psalm, verse 10, creating me a clean heart, renew the right, a right spirit within me. So there, there he is, you know, praying for God to put everything right again. Uh, cast me not away from your presence and notice this, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Now, uh, the reason why I underline that in verse 11 is that often these conditional security folk will use the example of the Holy Spirit leaving somebody as equivalent to losing their salvation. Uh, well, the thing is, we only have Old Testament examples of the Holy Spirit leaving in a couple of cases. Um, perhaps Samson and Saul come to mind. It's not really documented in the New Testament that that can happen. But there is actually a distinction between the giving of the Holy Spirit and uh, actually being saved. That they're not directly the, the Holy Spirit is given to those that believe as is eternal life, but the two things are not directly connected together. Because in John's Gospel, people were saved, but and people believed, but the Holy Spirit was not yet given. So, if you want a bit more information on that, uh, you can see on my channel a video on John chapter seven, biblical salvation settled once and for all, where I delve a bit more into that. I'm not going to delve into that hugely in this video. Uh, but God willing, uh, if, if I don't take too much time with other things, we may be able to look at the example of Saul, because I think that's a really good um, example of somebody who lost the spirit and did sin, yet still made it to heaven. I think that's something that we will try and deal with later if we can. Uh, moving along the psalm then, uh, watch this, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. So he's not saying, Lord, give me my salvation back. He's asking for the joy of salvation. Very important that every, every word in, in the Bible matters, okay? We don't just take salvation and pretend that, no, it's the joy of salvation. The one word makes all the difference. And then look in verse 13, and you could say this is another reason, if you like, as to what why David's praying this prayer, that I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. So the, the goal of David obtaining mercy here is that people who are themselves transgressors and people who are sinners shall be converted uh, based on David's prayer here. Now, the problem with people like Epiusion is that when they take the word sinner, they automatically assume that that means anybody who even makes one mistake and sins, so it's just anybody who does sin, right? So when they see Old New Testament 
uh, passages like whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin etc they apply that to a christian who sins but actually if you do a concordance check on when the word sinners appear particularly when you look at it in the psalms and, and how the psalmists use it even though we do have examples like psalm 51 of david praying for forgiveness and mercy for his own sins he doesn't describe himself as a sinner okay he he refers to sinners as being those on the outside those who are the wicked those who are completely outside of god's will not not believers who have stumbled or, or sin um, for whatever reason that might be also uh, some people might think well what about when jesus said i came to call sinners to repentance well we're going to look at the repentance issue later um because that's another thing of epiusians that I've, I've got to take down and deal with that but i have done a video on my channel repentance for salvation biblical salvation settled once and for all where we we dealt with the issue of what does it mean for a sinner to repent unto salvation because it, it doesn't mean turn from all of your sins literally and never sin again that's not what it means it means to believe on the lord jesus christ but we'll, we'll deal with that later and i've dealt with it in that video as well if, if you want more information about that but it's very important to acknowledge that when david's saying sinners here it's referring to those on the outside it's not even necessarily israelites in this case it's just people who are not of god but he hasn't referred to himself as a sinner he's just acknowledged that he is somebody who has sinned nevertheless he he is one of god's children so he'll go on to say in this prayer deliver me from blood guiltiness uh, you god you are the god you are the god of my salvation my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness so he's appealing to god to get his joy back uh, and then the psalm comes to a, a really great end where he, he says you desire not sacrifice otherwise i would give it the sacrifices are a broken spirit um, a broken and contrite heart and, and god you will not despise and so why say all this why am i pointing all of this out why have we spent so minutes uh, many minutes on this psalm well well, it's because it demonstrates an ongoing need for God's forgiveness. Okay. Because what I've noticed when I've looked through Epiusion's stuff, I don't know if he started out like this, but it seems to have been going more and more that way, is that he started to delve into sinless perfectionism. Now, he perhaps won't come out and say it like some sinless perfectionists will say, but it's, it seems to be leading him down that road that you've got to be completely without sin uh, because if, if you even do a mistake or you, you sin, whether it's willful or, or whatever it might be, that you then become the servant of sin and now you lose your salvation and can't enter heaven. And we'll, we'll, look, we'll look more about that later. But it, it demonstrates an ongoing need for forgiveness. And we see examples of this in the New Testament as well. This is not just something that only Old Testament saints struggled with. You know, Jesus said, uh, he taught us how to pray with the Lord's Prayer. He said, forgive us, Lord, our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And he also, in the same prayer, said, give us our daily bread. So it's not like we just pray once and we repent of all of our sins and then we never need God's forgiveness again because it's all been dealt with and we're not going to sin anymore because now we're walking a righteous path. No, the Bible's very clear that there is an ongoing need for, for God's forgiveness and this will just continue to unfold uh, as we progress. And then one more psalm I thought I'd delve into is Psalm 88 because this is a trickier psalm than the one that we've just read and, and it will show you how you see i could pluck a verse out of here and say well see one saved always saved in the old testament but then epiusion could pluck a verse out of the same psalm and say we'll see conditional security in the old testament so this is an example of a very difficult psalm and this is where you have to be uh, really careful about understanding how this ties in with with the whole bible so uh, when you read this psalm, it's, O Lord, uh, Lord God of my salvation, uh, let, let my prayer come before you, incline your ear to my cry. And then it goes on to say things like, my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near unto uh, the grave. Uh, I am counted with, with them that go into the pit there in verse 4, uh, free among the dead. So you see, someone like Epusian, I, I don't think he's ever referenced this psalm, but, but someone could use this psalm and try and twist it and say well see the person that's appealing to god here is describing himself as death as if you know maybe he lost his salvation and went to hell particularly as well when it goes on to say uh, you have laid me in the lowest pit in in darkness etc well the thing that you have to remember is uh, some of the psalms are actually not necessarily that relevant to the person writing them some of them are actually prophetic about 
Jesus Christ. Because like the psalm that says, uh, you will not leave my soul in hell. Well, the person who wrote that psalm wasn't in hell. He was on the earth. He hadn't gone to hell because he hadn't died yet for a start. But it's a reference to Jesus and it's quoted in uh, Acts chapter 2, I think, um, uh, when the apostles are referencing Jesus. And so that's what you have to understand a lot about this. And there's the whole controversy about whether Jesus went to hell or heaven in the three days between his uh, death, burial and resurrection. I'm not going to get into that in this video. Um, so the, the point is just don't let anybody just take these verses and just apply it to you like you can lose your salvation. Uh, some of this is actually a reference to um, Jesus Christ. But look what the psalm goes on to say. Uh, you have put uh, my mine acquaintance far from me there. You have made me an abomination unto them. Uh, I am shut up. I cannot come, for, uh, come forth. Mine eye mourns by reason of affliction. So uh, the psalmist is expressing that he's been afflicted by God uh, in some way. And obviously we can't take a literal application to the, the death verses because this person isn't in hell. He's not writing from hell. He's writing on the earth. He hasn't gone there but he's describing it like he's experiencing that and then he goes on to the psalmist goes on to ex, to ask these hypothetical questions here in verses 11 and 12 so have a look at this shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave or your faithfulness in destruction shall the wonders be known in the dark and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness so the way that these hypothetical questions are worded seem to indicate that the, the overall flavor of them is that the answer to those questions is no uh, your loving kindness shall not be declared in the grave uh, or in destruction your faithfulness uh, your wonders shall not be known in the dark uh, it's it's the land of forgetfulness okay so this seems to be a very negative place um, and if again if we have a more holistic understanding of the bible we tie that in with uh, what hell is it's it's the judgment of of god on those that that reject him and reject his love and reject what christ did um, and so uh, no then you would argue that his loving kindness shall not be declared in the in the grave uh, his faithfulness will not be shown in destruction. That's the very reason why they are destruction and they are the grave. So tying all that in then, if you were to look through this psalm through the lens of somebody who believes you can lose salvation, well, God already told David that he will not take his loving kindness away from David utterly. But then if you're going to say, well, David can lose his salvation, and if he does, then he goes to the grave. Well, in the grave loving kindness is not declared according to this psalm so then we appear to be having a contradiction here now they'll try and get away uh, around this by saying oh well god's not going to take it away from you but you can walk away from it well that's going to present some problems as well so when i get to dealing with john and uh, epiusium's false interpretations of john we can look at that in a bit more detail but it's it's really when they say well you can't he's not going to take it away from you but you can walk away from it it's really a sleight of hand really uh, we we see David sinned, but there's no evidence that David lost his salvation. There's no evidence that David walked away from his salvation, but he did lose his joy and he did suffer for those sins. And, that, and that's going to come re really important because Epiusium loves to uh, strawman Osas as making a green light on sin. We're going we're gonna to show him doing that. But we've seen what happened to David here. And there's examples of things that happened to other people uh, in the Bible as well, which uh, we'll, we'll tap into uh, later. But if you can understand this, if you can understand how God deals with the sins of believers, then Osas, while still recognising that God hates sin and we shouldn't do it, does start to make perfect sense, if you can grasp this. Now, Epiusion at least appears like he doesn't grasp this. Me, personally, I think he chooses not to grasp this. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show an example of that, actually, where he, he just cho chooses to, to not understand this deliberately. So he's he's done this video, when exactly do we lose our salvation? Is it after one sin? Is it after ten sins and a thousand sins? I'm obviously not I'm not going to play a lot of this just because for the sake of time it's quite a long video. But uh, he introduces the topic with this question and he explains the three points of view. So you've got number one, as long as you haven't completely lost your faith, which that's not connected to works. So that's the people that say you can lose your salvation, but not because of works, just because of faith. He then mentions that there's sinless perfectionism where you absolutely cannot sin at all. You must be absolutely perfect. 
And then there's uh, somewhere in between, and obviously there's, there's various positions within this category. Well, he goes on to quantify this as the video progresses, that salvation is, well, he says it's relational, not transactional. So not all sin is the same. And that's true, not all sin is the same. So you've got something like blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is something that's very uh, extreme, mark of the beast, something that's very extreme. But then uh, he goes on to explain uh, that there's a, a sin that leads not on to death. Um, that that one there in 1 John 5, 17. So he's trying to explain that sin has various different measures. Some are more extreme than others. The penalties are not necessarily the same in each case. And if it weren't for conditional security, he, he would be right about that. Um, not, not all sin is equal. That's unbiblical. Now, obviously, you only have to transgress one and you've transgressed them all if you're going to try and keep the law for salvation or if, if it's declared that you're... Uh, worthy of condemnation if you haven't believed but the way that god punishes sin is not always the same and actually some sins are more severe than others for a variety of reasons which i'm not i'm not going to get into that now but um about 27 minutes in it then appears as if he's going to deal with this question more absolutely and give you a definitive answer but he doesn't he actually deflects it onto one saved always saved people to answer the question for him, which is just really bizarre, but but he relates it to the chastisement of believers because that that's something that we believe in, and as we've just looked at, we we've seen it in the Bible. It's a pattern that we can understand. So just have a look at what he says here. Now, uh, so so many people ask, so how many sins can I commit then? So exactly, what's the number? You know, is it one sin? Is it ten sins? Is it a hundred? Is it a thousand? And really, this is just the wrong question to be asking. But, uh, but nonetheless, it is, it, is a, it is a question that needs to be dealt with. Um, but I have questions for people who would ask this question. My question would be, so how many sins can you commit before God judges you? So a lot of people who believe in one saved, always saved, do believe that God disciplines you and chastens you. My question to you would be how many question or how many sins does it take for God to discipline you and to like you did Jezebel throw her onto a sickbed so so how many times did she have to commit sexual immorality because if, because if you're going to ask me exactly how many sins it takes to lose salvation then you're going to have to answer this question how many sins does it take to be disciplined or punished by God and so there you have it, folks. He's been asked a genuine question by people that follow him and people that believe like him. And he could have even just explained that it's not quantifiable and used discipline as kind of like a simile to that, that, you know, it's kind of like this. It's not necessarily quantifiable. But here's why that's, it's really ridiculous though, because he's then saying, well, us who believe in OSAS but still believe in chastisement, we've got to explain how many sins it takes before God chastises you. But that's a really moronic response because losing your salvation and being chastised by God are not directly equivalent. You cannot directly compare those things, but he acts like that's a very valid question. Well, it's not, and here's why. The salvation is yes or no. It's not measured by in-betweens. Either somebody is saved or somebody is not saved. They're not half saved or semi-saved or partially saved. Either somebody's saved or they're not saved. And moreover, when we have our go-to verses about gaining salvation, such as whosoever believes in him, we're dealing with absolutes. They shall never perish. I should lose nothing. It's not I. they might perish or I may lose something. It it's yes or no. Somebody is saved or isn't saved. It's not quantifiable in various measurement. The chastisement of believers, though, is not the same for every person in manner or in measure. Different people will receive different punishments according to the severity of sin and how much knowledge they have about the laws of God. So I know what the Bible says about drunkenness. I know what the Bible says about fornication. I know what the Bible says about this, that, and the other. So if I go out and do those things, my chastisement 
is going to be unimaginably sorer than the new baby Christian who doesn't know what the Bible says about those things. Okay, so the chastisement of believers is not really quantifiable. It, it, it's different for different people according to a variety of factors. Salvation isn't. Salvation, either you are saved or you're not. Okay, there's no severity of salvation. And so it, it's really, it's a, it's a stupid deflection. It, it dodges the question. And actually... He has actually answered this question somewhere else. He just chooses not to answer it in this video because, again, he picks and chooses contradictory argument points if and when it suits him to do so. So let me show you where he just makes the answer much simpler for you. So this is a video titled, How Will Christians Be Judged? And uh, a couple of people have asked him very similar questions in the comments. So let's see if I can find these. So... For example, this guy here asks, do you have to be sanctified to go to heaven? Do you have to be perfect? We can't just have a yes or no answer. But uh, here he goes on to explain, according to Jesus, anyone who is still a slave to sin will not remain in the house forever. You must be made free from your sin and you will not make it. Now, when he says free of your sin, he means free from even the, the propensity to sin or just being free by never doing those sin it doesn't mean free from the death penalty of sin which is what that actually means in context of that verse i've done a study on john chapter 8 you can go find it biblical salvation settled once and for all so that that's what he says there and then further down are we to try and be perfect or actually be perfect this person asks because i don't see how it is possible to be exactly perfect well he says we won't be perfect in the same in the, in the way that we won't have an accident that, that's not sin related but then sin he then asks this hypothetical question which sin specifically do you believe that jesus's blood can't free you from and again he doesn't mean that jesus's blood washes you from that sin he means that you will stop doing it that's what he means so the answer then folks based on those two answers there how many sins does it take to lose your salvation well the answer is one in the way that he's interpreting free from sin there's your answer. So he's tried to deflect it onto one uh, OSAS people to try and answer it for him indirectly. Well, it's not my job to answer it for you. It's your doctrine. You answer it. And he doesn't make a point on his channel of saying that he's a sinless perfectionist, but he kind of says it without really saying it, essentially. We, you know, quote in verses like, we have to be perfect as Heavenly Father is perfect and so on. So he says he's kind of hinting at being a sin sinless perfectionist without actually saying that he is. But that's another matter for another day. And so to compare losing your salvation, which is really an on-off switch, with the chastisement of believers shows that he does not understand the chastisement of believers. He chooses not to accept it because it answers the question of how, how can you get around the issue of sin with one saved, always saved? Aren't you just making excuses to sin? But he constantly tries to straw man Osas as, as that we say it's okay to go out and sin. In fact, I'll show you this article of him saying this. So is he published this article on the YouTube community thing eternal security proponents lay down your weapons and the premise of it is that he thinks we're fighting this pointless battle by standing for one saved always saved and we're wasting our effort fighting for the wrong kingdom and, and this that and the other and then he goes on to say uh how how can you uh how can i say such a thing okay hypothetically it's because you have to understand you who believe in osas are fighting for in the first place you are fighting for the freedom to sin that's exactly what it boils down to and you will you will not likely admit it or you'll get angry at him for saying it and try to defend yourself blah 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 but that's exactly what you're fighting for he can't have a quote as of saying hey let's go out and sin but that's what he seems to think we're, we're fighting for and again just to further prove that he just does not get this at all he tries to straw man it by equating it with the lie that the devil told Eve in the garden in Genesis 3 4 you shall not surely die and uh, then he goes on to say that when you stand before Jesus he's going to cut you up for teaching people that even if they sinned they would still make it to heaven well let's go over a, a few things as to why this is so stupid okay first of all when the snake told Eve you shall not surely die okay and then Adam and Eve sinned and sin entered into the world they didn't lose salvation quote unquote because they were not saved right they were just simply not condemned because sin hadn't entered into the world they weren't saved because what were they saved from what consequence 
would would have befell them if they hadn't have been saved from the consequence when there was no sin, there was no consequence. So it doesn't make sense to call them saved when you actually understand the meaning of what that word means. Now, Ad Adam and Eve before the fall would be more akin to like a, a baby, a, a young child that doesn't know anything yet. Well, they're not saved. They haven't believed on the Lord Jesus Christ that thou shalt be saved, but they haven't exactly done any sin to have broken the law either. So if they died in utero or died at birth, well, we assume they go to heaven because what sin can be accounted for them? But they're not saved because they're not delivered from some sort of consequence that would have fallen upon them because they haven't sinned. That's what that actually means. It doesn't mean that you can lose your salvation because they weren't saved in the conventional sense of the word. It doesn't make any sense. And again, he, he chooses not to understand this stuff. And then he comes up with this bit here. He will cut you into pieces as any righteous king would for committing treason against him by telling God's children they can break God's laws and not die. And again, it, it's straw manning as, as, as going around saying this when we're not. Okay. Now, guess what? If you break God's law, you can die physically. Okay. That's a good enough reason in itself to stop sinning. But nobody's going around saying, hey, let's break all of God's laws because we can. I, I don't know anybody who says this. Now, I'm sure there are some hyper grace folk that maybe do say that. But most Christians do not go around saying, hey, it's OK to sin. Let's see how much we can get away with. Now, they try and move the goalposts with sin or they'll try and put things in a category of not sin when it is. I get that. But no Christian is saying, hey, let's see how many laws we can break, or at least not, not that any that I know of. And actually, let me show you out of Jesus' own mouth that technically speaking, there will be some people that break the commandments and teach other people to do so, and yet still technically make it into the kingdom of heaven. Because you, you can have all this man-made logic about how, well, you're saying that people can sin and still make it to heaven. But at the end of the day, does your man-made logic really matter? Or does the words of Jesus actually matter? So let's go to the words of Jesus himself. So this is four verses from Matthew chapter five. This is when Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount. Now look carefully at the colour coding that I've used and look carefully at the words that Jesus is saying here. So he says from verse 17, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them at the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So I'm just going to give you just a few seconds. Have a look at that. Look carefully at the words in blue. Look at the difference between those who broke the commandments and taught others so and the Pharisees. And then look at the difference between those who broke the commandments and those who did the commandments and just look at the differences in blue. So just hold that thought for a second. OK, now I'm going to show you this in diagram form. So then what have we read? Well, we've got some sort of line somewhere of let's just call this righteousness on the righteousometer. OK, your righteousness has got to exceed the line. So your righteousness has got to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And you may be called least in the kingdom of heaven, or you may be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Sorry, my uh, camera is obstructing it up there. Or if your righteousness does not exceed that of the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You are excluded from the kingdom of heaven. OK, so then the righteousness of the Pharisees, they did not have the righteousness to enter into the kingdom of heaven. They are excluded from the kingdom. But Jesus said, those who shall break my commandments and teach others to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. OK, they're in the kingdom. Whereas those who did Jesus's commandments and taught others to do so, they shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. There's the difference. That means that according to this passage, 
There are people who broke Jesus' commandments and taught others to do so, yet you'll never believe this. They exceeded the righteousness of the Pharisees. So you can look at this and you can say, well, you're just making an excuse for people to break Jesus' commandments and make it into heaven. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what it sounds like. It doesn't matter what your rebuttal is. That's what Jesus said. So unless you think that Jesus is a crazy person that can't get his own doctrine right, that's the words of Christ himself. End of debate. Deal with it. But we're not going to end it there, folks, because I've got so much more to cover. And we're, what, two, three hours into this video, and I'm barely getting started here. But it's a case close right there, folks. I could leave it there, really. But we've got so much more to cover. So let's just let's just explore a little bit more this issue of believers who sin and making it into heaven. Because if you can just grasp for one miserable day the chastisement of believers, this will all make perfect sense. But just, just before we do that, just one last little bit to look at this stupid article he wrote. He says, just like the Pharisees killed Jesus and attacked the apostles and thought they were completely justified. You know, he's trying to put us in like that same camp. Like, sorry, what conditional security person has ever been killed by somebody who believes in OSAS? You know, it was the Catholics who were going around killing everybody hundreds of years ago, and they believe that you can lose your salvation. But you know what, though, folks? Those of us who believe in faith alone and one saved, always saved... No, we don't think we're completely justified in, in the things that we do. Now, he thinks he's justified by the things that he does. He thinks that because he obeys Jesus' commandments and he's got all these works of obedience, he's going to make it into heaven. I'm not based on that premise, folks. My righteousness is justified by faith without works, because that's what Romans says. But again, it's all coming. So this is completely stupid. He tries to compare it to the Pharisees and it's like he just has no grasp of irony whatsoever. So uh, yeah, let, let's. T I'm going to take you to a video where he poses this challenge and it's about sinners who make it into heaven. So we're revisiting this video, everyone who lost their salvation in the NT. Um, we looked at this earlier with the issue of Simon the Sorcerer and I think I'm going to come back to this video later because there's so many things wrong with the way that he uses some verses to justify this, like verses that aren't even addressed to individuals, but that's everyone who lost their salvation so uh, i'm not going to play a clip this time but he he about 40 seconds 46 seconds in he uh says he poses this challenge what i'd like to do is before we get started flip the tables on them oh sass folk and i would like to ask them if they could name one single instance of the bible where somebody continued in willful unrepentant sin all the way to their death and never repented and they went to heaven. Now, I should just point out to you that several times throughout his videos, he's posted challenges like this, like, this is my challenge to Osas, this is my challenge to you guys to answer this. But the bottom line is, folks, when he asks these things or, or makes these challenges, he's not interested in the answer. He, he He's not interested one bit. He has not got ears to hear the answer. It's just, it's just vain jangling. It's just him making a noise, trying to sound smart and act like he's got you and won the game when really you can answer it and he's still not interested because he's just going to find a way around the answer or he's going to beg the question. I'm going to show you that because I actually addressed this challenge from my personal channel before I set up this channel. And I actually gave four examples. Okay. Now, some of a couple of the examples, yeah, maybe a bit iffy, but uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to show you some of this stuff. So the four ex I gave four examples. I gave the example of Abraham. I gave the example of Saul. I gave the example of Samson, and I gave the example of the thief on the cross. Okay, now you can sort of see my comments there where I try to explain myself. And maybe some of them I didn't explain it very well, or maybe I made a couple of like minor errors. Like, for example, I said that Abraham, uh, in the final years of his life, had multiple wives. Well, actually, Genesis 25 only really explains that he had concubines because uh, Sarah had died, so it was okay for him to take another wife. Uh, so I made a bit of a mistake about saying that multiple wives bit there. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to the Bible itself to explain basically what I've already explained uh, in this comment. But, you know, I've, I've shown you what the video is. You can go find the comment if you want my original comment. And then I'm going to show you his reply where he, he kind of weasel out of, of, of it and just tries to throw it away, basically. So let's look at the first example of Abraham. So I think it's most obvious to, to, to people that Abraham, of all the characters in the Bible, we know that Abraham made it to heaven. We've got passages like Luke that say the Lord God of Abraham, he's not the God of the dead, but of the living. You've got the story in Luke 16, where it talks about the beggar going to 
Abraham's bosom, which is synonymous with heaven. So I don't think any Christian would argue that Abraham didn't make it to heaven. Well, if you look at the last thing that happened to him in Genesis chapter 25 before he died, one of the last things that it says about him is, unto the sons of the concubines which Abraham had. So we can see here that Abraham had concubines. He had children with women that he wasn't married to. Okay, well, that's adultery. And that's one of the last things it tells, and then two, two verses later, he dies. So this is one of the last things we hear about him. And we also know, obviously, even among his wives, he had two because he had Sarah and he had Hagar. Now, some people might come up with this argument, well, maybe Abraham didn't know it was a sin, or maybe it wasn't told to Abraham that it was sinful. Well, this is a bit of a cop-out answer, because if you go to Matthew 19, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees about, they ask him a question about adultery and, and divorce. Is it okay for a man to divorce his wife? Now, Jesus doesn't point to the law of Moses. He actually points to Genesis 2, long before Abraham. And he, he establishes this principle that goes all the way back to Genesis, that the two shall become one flesh. Now, obviously, Jesus is not discussing the issue of concubines specifically, but he does argue that even to divorce is adultery. OK, so he's still talking about adultery and Abraham committed adultery. Well, Jesus references the beginning of creation, Genesis 2, the two shall be one flesh. doesn't say the four shall be one flesh or the three with the one shall be one flesh. It's the two shall be one flesh. That's an example from Genesis. That's what Jesus said. So that's really pretty conclusive that it must have been adul uh, adultery for Abraham to do that. And the thing is, even without the law of Moses, well, Abel still knew to give sacrifices. Abraham still knew that the city of Sodom was wicked, even without the, the law of Moses. So the thing is, people still knew stuff. OK, folks. Now, just to pre-warn you, I did make a couple of um, mistakes in my comment, because I'm, I'm useless at typing comments. So uh, I said it was Matthew 12. It's actually Matthew 19. But I pointed all this out. Ab Abraham had concubines. It's demonstrated. We've got proof from the Bible that he had concubines. OK, we've got proof from the Bible that Jesus said it's the two shall be one flesh. Adultery goes all the way back to the beginning of creation. That's what Jesus said. So I point all of that out. And then further down in my comment, I then also explain this important concept that people like him just choose not to grasp. And it's the chastisement of believers. Now, Abraham made it to heaven despite committing adultery. But what did happen to Abraham as a result of his adultery? Well, if you remember the story of Hagar, now, I, again, this is another one of my mistakes. I put Haggai there, it's Hagar. But ha Hagar had to leave. There was all that jealousy between her and Sarah. So Hagar had to leave for her safety. She took her son with him. Her, so Abraham couldn't see his own son anymore, Ishmael. Okay, so is that something that you want to happen to your life? Do you want your son to disappear and never see him again? Well, there's an example of how Abraham suffered for his adultery without going to hell. So I've pointed all this stuff out to him, folks, okay? Bearing in mind, he set this challenge. Show me in the Bible where somebody sinned and still made it to heaven without repenting, obviously. Pointed that out to him, and this is his answer. Now, there's obviously, I'm going to address the other characters as well. But he's saying, Abraham is the only one that even closely meets the qualification with, with all the people that I was talking about. And, but let, look, just look at this moronic reply here. However, where does it say that he didn't repent? Well, my point exactly, folks, it doesn't say that he repented. Now, if it's so rep important that we repent of all of our sins before we make it to heaven, wouldn't it be important that the Bible would have pointed that out? It doesn't point it out. Now, I can show you my Bible that I've got evidence that Abraham had concubines. I've got evidence from the Bible that Jesus said all the way back to Genesis 2 that the two shall be one flesh, not the four or the five or the six shall be one flesh. I've got evidence, folks, from the Bible to prove what I'm saying here. He's got no evidence that Abraham repented. But then he throws this argument, well, where does it say he didn't repent? And this is an example of begging the question. He's asked, where did somebody sin and not repent and still made it to heaven? You show him an example. Oh, well, it doesn't say he didn't repent, so he must have repented. Well, no, you prove that he repented. You haven't got any. So that's a valid answer to his stupid challenge. But you see, he's begging the question, folks, because he's not interested in the answer. And this is just going to come about with all the other examples that I'm going to bring up, by the way. He then goes on to say, also, comma, Abraham had great troubles that arose from his child with Abraham. Well, the way that he's wording that sentence makes it sound like it's a surprise, like I failed to point that out or hadn't even noticed that. 
But I did point that out, folks. I already mentioned that in my original comment. It was the precise point that I'm trying to get across to this person that people sin and if they don't repent but they still make it to heaven they do suffer on this earth that's the, the whole premise of my comment that i made originally and it, it, it just chooses not to grasp this well where does it say you know also this he had great trouble yes i've already pointed that out to you but then he has the gall to say in this comment that I either didn't listen or didn't care well that's a bit ironic coming from him because he's replied to a comment without even reading it properly and it's just more of this hypocrisy where he applies a different standard to it to himself than he applies to osas and then goes around telling everybody how we all need to be sinless and perfect to make it into heaven well if he falls short of his own standard it's bizarre and furthermore also where does it say specifically that God told him during his lifetime that it was a sin? It doesn't matter. Jesus said, the two shall be one flesh, Genesis 2. So that's, again, a stupid answer, a question because he didn't read my comment properly, obviously. He, talking, try, Trying to reason with this guy, because he's like, show me this in the Bible. I challenge you once that, well, we're trying to show you. We're trying to explain it to you. But all we get is, bah, bah, bah. That, that's all we get from him. That, that's all we get. You know, like when you're a kid, put, put your fingers in your ears it's just it's ridiculous so he's going to do that with the other examples but let me, let me show you one of the other examples next so another example i gave was saul because saul is sometimes the poster child for characters in the bible who lost their salvation well you know i think it's no accident that the bible tells us some very critical details with stuff like this so there's the story of Samson. I'm just going to jump straight to uh, 1 Samuel 28, okay? And what happens in this story, this is where Saul asks the witch of Endor to bring up Samuel's spirit. Now, with that in mind, because obviously that that is ne sort of talking to the dead, um, some would question whether it really was Samuel. It could have been some demonic spirit talking. Well, it's the narrator that says it's Samuel. And earlier in the story, when, it, when it's in verse 9... Uh, this is bearing in mind Saul has disguised himself and the woman said unto him you know that Saul is going so she doesn't know it's Saul at first okay but then uh, as 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 uh, Samuel's spirit is summoned she cries with a loud voice and the woman spake to Saul saying why have you deceived me for you are Saul so she obviously recognizes then that this is Saul after this so so I'm inclined to believe that this is a legitimate this is Samuel legitimately also, uh, Samuel asks the question, uh, "Why have you disquieted me?" That's there in, in verse fifteen. So, wh why, you know, why have you done this to me? Why, why have you disquieted my spirit? So, I don't think he'd be asking that question if it, if it was really a demonic spirit. So then, Samuel pronounces judgment on Saul, and bearing in mind that Samuel had already died, this is his spirit coming back from the dead to speak to Saul in this story, and he's pronouncing that Saul is going to die the next day with his sons out in the battlefield and we know from the story that that's what happened Saul fell on his own sword he died by suicide okay but look what Samuel says here look at the language that he uses and again I'm it's, it's no accident that the Bible gives us these details because God knew that we'd be having these sorts of arguments tomorrow shall you and your sons be with me so where was Samuel was he in heaven or was he in hell you be the judge of that, folks, because Samuel was a prophet of God. He was a good man. So you and your son shall be with me. Well, that's a really ridiculous statement if they're not going to be with him in heaven, unless you think Samuel was in hell. So again, further proof that, that Saul sinned and technically still made it to heaven. Bearing in mind, he died falling on his own sword. Now, is that how you want to end up, folks? Just think about that. So again, I point that all out in my original comment. OK, I addressed all of that. What does he reply? So let's see if I can find Saul here. King Saul, nowhere in the entire Bible does it say he went to heaven. Yes, but I did point that out about tomorrow you and your son shall be with me. But then he doesn't even address that. He just does not address it at all. And then in the same comment, same sentence, you either didn't listen or you didn't care. Well, why don't you address the point that I raised about you and your sons be with me? Why don't you answer that point in your comment? But you see, because he's commenting all of this, he can just not answer it and nobody's going to notice. You know, they're just going to miss the fact that he's he's dodged that, that point. Or he just didn't read my comment 
again. So there's King Saul for you. You and your son shall be with me. Well, where's Samuel? Because he wasn't on earth other than his spirit appearing on the earth and he was going back into the earth again or back wherever his spirit came from. So unless you think that a prophet of God ended up in hell, that statement makes no sense and you're making Samuel sound like a crazy person unless logically Saul went to heaven to be with Samuel. Now, the next example I gave was Samson. Now, of these four examples, Samson is probably the least clear example. Okay, so I'm going to have to argue more from a logical argument rather than one of absolute proof. So, Samson it isn't isn't really absolute proof, but I'll, I'll show you my, my case for, for Samson anyway. So, uh, I'm not going to go through all of Samson's life because, you know, there'd just be too much to go through. But uh, we know that he committed adultery. We know that he uh, ate unclean food, which he shouldn't have done as an Israelite, but he especially shouldn't have done as someone who was taking the Nazarite vow. Um, and uh, he there was a lot of tit for tat between him and the Philistines. And sometimes you wonder, was he justified always in killing the Philistines sometimes? And there was a lot of that stuff going on. Well, Samson did, again, suffer in his life. He was blinded. Uh, he lost his strength and he was taken by the Philistines. He had his crops and fields burnt. So Samson suffered in this life for his sins. Now, the very last thing that we read about Samson, as he as he then uh, pulls in the pillars um, and prays to God here, and this is the point where Samson dies, look at what Samson's prayer is. This is what we have documented that Samson said to God. So in, in Judges 16, verse 28, says, Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray you, and strengthen me, I pray you, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. So of all the sins that have gotten Samson into this situation in the first place, it's it's kind of his own fault, really, that he's in this situation. What does he say to the Lord? Father, forgive me, I've lost my salvation. Please, I repent. Please give it me back. Oh, that's not what he prays. Or even just, Father, forgive me, I have sinned, not what he prays. Or even, Lord, may I help me to do this now so I can do it for your glory. Again, not what he says. He prays for his own revenge. Now, mysteriously, God answers that prayer, but, that, but that's what he prays for. No evidence that he's repented of all of his sins. No evidence that he's repented of everything that got him in, in this mess. He doesn't say sorry to God. He doesn't ask for his salvation back. And again, if he can lose his salvation, that would seem like a pretty important thing to be asking for, wouldn't it, folks? We don't have that documented about Samson. He just prays that, oh, let me get my own back uh, for my two eyes on these guys, even though he got himself into that situation in the first place. Now, in... Again, it doesn't say that Samson made it to heaven, so some people would argue that he perhaps lost his salvation. But again, people always embellish this story here to make it sound like he got it back. But as I've just shown, it doesn't say that he repented. It doesn't say he asked for his salvation back. We've got nothing of that kind. In Hebrews 11, so Hebrews 11 is the kind of what, what, we, what we sometimes call the hall of faith. And this is where the writer of Hebrews commends lots of different Bible characters for their faith. And then he goes on to say, and what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell you of this guy, this guy, this guy. And and he mentions, uh, sorry, I don't know why I've highlighted Samuel. I meant to highlight Samson. Again, this is me getting confused. So he mentions Samson and he's, he's praising Samson's faith there. Okay. Now, Epiusion did answer this. Um, and I'll hear his answer on this one. Probably the, the least stupid answer of all the ones that he addressed. So it's not stated, and, and it's a vague example. I get that. I'm arguing from logic rather than absolute proof. Fair enough. God gave him back his strength at the end, but it's not stated either way at, at the end. Fine. But then he goes on to say, although he is listed in the Hall of Faith as demonstrating great faith, but it doesn't go on to say that he's in heaven or hell. Well, well that's fine. But the thing is, if you actually read the story of Samson, it's not really a story of somebody who was that faithful. Now, yes, he had supernatural strength, but he didn't even earn that strength, really. He just followed the Nazarite vow, and God gave him supernatural strength as long as he didn't cut his hair. And he did break the Nazarite vow by eating uh, the carcass of a lion, or if I'm trying to remember the story. But it was his hair that kept his strength. So it's only because he had faith in God that 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 promise would be fulfilled, that he could even do that stuff. But his life, it, it's not the life of a faithful person, really. So if you're going to commend his faith, well, there's not really a great deal to talk about. And yet we see him commended in the Hall of Faith. Now, if he didn't make it to heaven, 
logically speaking, wouldn't that be a bad example of faith? Now, again, I'm going to leave that with you. That's a logical answer. I can't absolutely prove that Samson made it to heaven, so it's not my strongest point. But it doesn't sound like his faith is really that good of an example if he lost his salvation, when that's really the most important thing. But I'll, I'll leave that with you, folks. So the last example that I gave was the thief on the cross. Okay, so this is uh, documented in Luke chapter 22, 39 to 43. So uh, there's the story leading up to it. So uh, Jesus is being crucified. Uh, the crowd are mocking him. And then it says in verse 39 that one of the ma uh, malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If you be the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebu rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, seeing that you are in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into the kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Ver Verily I say unto you, Today shall you be with me in paradise. So we see here that Jesus uh, says that the thief on the cross will be in, in paradise. Okay? So most Christians would agree that that's um, just another way of saying heaven. It sounds like a nice place wherever it is. That's quite a positive word for something that doesn't mean heaven if if he went to a worse place. Now, when he, appear, when he appealed to Jesus, look what he says to Jesus. He says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, he doesn't say, Lord, I repent of being a thief. Lord, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Lord, please give me my salvation back. He doesn't, he doesn't say anything of that kind. There's no evidence that he's apologized or remorseful about being a thief, but he has at least acknowledged what he's done because he recognizes that he's justly receiving this condemnation. He's receiving the same condemnation as the Christ, except that he deserves it, whereas Christ doesn't. Now, in his reply, he, he does the same thing that he did with Abraham. He's begging the question again, because he says the thief on the cross, again, this same stupid question, where does it say he didn't repent of his sin? Well, the thing is, it, it, the point is that it doesn't say he did repent of his sin. And if it's so important that we repent of all of our sins to be saved, then wouldn't the Bible have pointed this out? It doesn't say that he turned from his sin. Okay. And then he goes on to say, did he keep stealing after he came to faith in Jesus? Well, again, a stupid question because he's about to die and he's still being condemned for his thievery. If you look on, uh, look at the passage again, uh, you, do you not fear God, seeing you are in the same condemnation and we indeed justly? He is justified in this condemnation, but it's not an eternal condemnation. It's an earthly condemnation, but he's still facing this condemnation for being a thief. Repenting of his sin doesn't get him out of this condemnation, but he, d he doesn't even apologize to the Lord or ask for forgiveness specifically. That's not there. And that's what we do have documented of him saying. We don't have him documented saying, Lord, I repent, forgive me, let me into your kingdom. That's just not what he says. So once again, I've got the evidence he hasn't. But then he goes on to say, was he still a sinner? No, because we know that sinners don't make it to heaven. So again, this is begging the question. He set a challenge. Show me where somebody sinned continue to sin until the end and still made it to heaven. We've given him his example. Oh, well, he must have repented because sinners don't make it to heaven. Well, again, there's no point setting the challenge then. It's a stupid question. It's a stupid challenge. You don't know that he turned from his sins because you've got no passage that says it. He just acknowledged his condemnation. Now, although it's a little bit off topic from the sin itself, is the issue of faith without works because people like him always lump turning from sin as being the main definition of works when actually it's just it's just one of the things that works covers so i'm just going to include it here anyway seeing as we're on the subject so in in his video the full gospel he's going to talk about how the thief on the cross so arguably has at least some works to show for his faith before he dies the thief on the cross he had faith uh, even though i mean you could say he still had works he still rebuked the other the other um person on the cross okay um, and he still proclaimed uh, and tried to witness and proclaim uh, the name of Jesus. But nonetheless, okay, he, he was saved. All, all he did, he, he didn't continue on the path because he only had, uh, you know, maybe hours to live. So amen, he was saved. 
So he's trying to argue that the thief on the cross had something to show for his faith, at least. But again, there's nothing in the passage that he really said in it works. Now, when it, he's kind of embellished what the thief actually did. He's acting like the thief was preaching Jesus in a way. But he wasn't. All he, all he just said was he just rebuked the other guy saying, do you not fear God? You're in the same condemnation while you're mocking him. That's really all he said. What actual work has he done? Because the thing is with this Epusion, he, he constantly tries to make it out like there's all these Christians who aren't going to make it to heaven because they don't have any works to show for their faith. But if just saying this one sentence here counts as work, well, there are millions of Christians getting the butt out of bed every Sunday morning going to church while everyone else is staying in bed. So most Christians have at least got more works than the thief on the cross. It's just it's just ridiculous. And again, it's because he cannot separate works from faith at all. He just cannot grasp that people are going to heaven, even when they've committed theft and they're going to die for that theft and they've got no works that we know of to show for their faith and they haven't even apologised for it, yet they make it to heaven. He just cannot handle it at all. So he's constantly trying to embellish what's actually going on here. It doesn't say that he had works. It doesn't say that he turned from his sins. And actually... He says quite the opposite because he we receive this due reward for our deeds. So he's acknowledging that his condemnation is because of his works. So there you have it, folks. So these are just all these different examples of people who sinned in the Bible and still made it to heaven. Because most of the characters in the Bible that we actually know a great deal about, God's people, all like people of God, not heathen, and many of them sinned. You know, the Bible is full of God's own people sinning story after story. I mean, we could go on forever, really. But, uh, you know, these are just some of the some of the clearest examples. So just to close off on the thief of the cross, I'm just going to answer one more straw man from uh, everyone who lost their salvation. So this guy asks here, sometimes uh, I ask easy believe people if the thief on the cross would have been a practicing thief if he had another three weeks to live. I am yet to get an answer back. Well, the thing is, we don't know, you see, because I don't imagine my own stories in the Bible. But the thing is, if he was almost killed for his theft, he probably would have stopped thieving, okay? But no evidence that has anything to do with his salvation. He would have stopped thieving because he probably doesn't want to be crucified if he would have been given that chance. You know, it's sort of like the story of the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8. You can't prove that that had anything to do with eternal life because Jesus never mentioned eternal life and he never mentioned believing on him. But he did say, go and sin no more. Bearing in mind, she was almost stoned to death for what she had just done. So if that's not a wake-up call, what is? So what you must understand is that when when, the, when you have these kind of physical condemnations, it's not always about salvation, okay? Sometimes it's a physical condemnation only. And so this is going to tie everything up with how people sinned and still made it to heaven, but we also understand the chastisement of believers so that, no, we're not advocating going round and doing a bunch of sin and getting away with it. That's not what we're saying at all. It's Epiusion Strawman. It's his lie. It's his false accusation. And so to wrap up, folks, on his ridiculous straw man, it raises the question then, if, if these men in the Bible sinned with no evidence that they ever repented and still made it to heaven, does that mean that I can sin, get away with it, and still go to heaven? Well, if you're contemplating that question, ask yourself these quite same questions as well, okay? Think about these. Do you want to be made permanently blind like Samson? Do you want your next child to die at birth like David? Do you want your son to leave you and likely never see him again like Abraham? Do you want to be stoned to death like the woman in caught in adultery almost was, or crucified like the thief? Do you want to be called least in the kingdom of heaven or great in the kingdom of heaven? Do you want to be disabled for many decades like the man at the pool of Bethesda? Do you want to be like Saul and die by falling on your own sword? Or do you want to be like Paul having already said, I fought the good fight? And you know what? Paul used to be called Saul but by the grace of God. He became Paul. And so even if you're making it to heaven, folks, surely anyone who's not Epiusion and actually has a brain in their head, can understand these perfectly legitimate and plausible reasons to want to turn from your sins, okay? And this is the kind of thing that happened to people in the Bible when they didn't 
turn from their sin. You see, we can open our Bible and prove that these things happened. We can't prove that these characters specifically lost their salvation, okay? There's just no verse that says such thing. It's just, it's utter conjecture, and it's just him planting his own false doctrine onto the stories. And of course, there is the issue to be addressed of all of the, all of the verses that he quote in that in that video about losing salvation. Um, I do intend to go through all of those. Um, next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to deal with the one saved, always saved issue first, because I start by defending it rather than trying to prove his stuff wrong, and then we can start to unravel what's wrong with the the verses that he uses to say otherwise. So we'll go into one saved, always saved next. <laughs> 